this talk is really to say what the Big Bang Theory really says, what the actual science is, because there's lots and lots of misconceptions about the Big Bang Theory. <clears throat> and then, uh, importantly in science, telling a nice story is great, but you need to have some evidence. So I'm going to show you the main lines of evidence in favor of the Big Bang Theory, and show you why it's well-motivated, and why it's the best explanation of the universe that we have. <clears throat> And so, the first thing I always like to say about the Big Bang Theory is I hate the name of the Big Bang Theory. And so this comes from a quote from an astronomer, Fred Hoyle. And Hoyle actually rejected the Big Bang Theory. He thought the Big Bang Theory was false. He was a proponent for what was called the steady state theory of cosmology. And so, prior to the 20th century, I think most scientists figured that the universe was infinitely old, that it had just always been around here. Uh, for instance, that's certainly what Einstein thought. He thought the universe should be infinitely old, and then he came out with his theory of general relativity. And in general relativity, the universe is a dynamic thing, not a static thing. So this was actually troubling for Einstein initially, because he wanted to have a nice static universe that was always there and always looked the same. And so Fred Hoyle was a proponent of this idea, and so he was on the, a BBC radio program. And he had this quote that earlier theories based on the hypothesis that all the matter in the universe was created in one big bang at a particular time in the remote past. <clears throat> and so he's sort of saying it dismissively. Why that caught on and became the name of the theory is completely beyond me, but I guess it has a nice ring to it, right, the big bang. So it caught on. I prefer to call it the theory of universal expansion, because that is very descriptive and very accurate for what it actually says. So as soon as you hear big bang theory, what do you picture as soon as you hear big bang? Sounds like an explosion, right? Some big explosion that happened in one spot. And so that's what it sounds like. That's what's even pictured here. And so this is an artist's conception. And I got this from a science website. This came from like NASA or something. And so these are people that understand science. And even they are picturing it this way as if it's an explosion. And so there are several problems with that, several reasons why it's not an explosion. First off, an explosion happens at one point in space at one point in time. All the stuff is here, and now it explodes. Right? Second off, the explosion has a center. You can see it right in the middle of that image. And so the explosion has a center. The explosion also has an edge. As things explode out, there's a point where the explosion hasn't reached yet. And so it's got a center, it's got an edge, and it takes place at one point in space and time. And none of this is true for the expansion of the universe. So the first thing we want to do is get this picture out of our heads. And instead, we'll start picturing something like this. As a scientist, you want to picture a graph and some data, right? So this is where we actually want to trace our story back to the early 20th century when various astronomers were looking out at spiral galaxies. And what they discovered was that the, the galaxies show what are called redshift. Um, so I've got some physics students in here, so some of us I know have heard of the Doppler effect before. And so any waves that are traveling will display the Doppler effect. And so if you've ever been on the road, surely we've all stood on the side of the road and heard traffic coming by. As the cars go by. And so what's going on there is you're hearing the sound waves coming from the car. And as they come towards you, the sound waves are kind of piling up on each other. And so the frequency that you're hearing is higher. The wavelength is shorter. And so it sounds like it's higher pitched. Now when the car goes by you, now it's lower pitched. And so now it's emitting these sound waves. But now since they're moving away from you, they're getting stretched out to longer wavelengths. And so the frequency is going down. For sound waves, this affects the frequency. And the way your brain perceives this is through sound. And so you hear a high pitch and then a low pitch. For light waves, you may or may not know light's a wave, but it is. The same thing can happen with light waves, only now when the wavelength gets shortened, it appears bluer to our eyes, and when it gets lengthened, it appears redder to our eyes. <clears throat> and so astronomers were looking at these various uh, galaxies out there, and in particular, there was one VM Slifer who made most of these early observations. And what he noticed was that looking at the spiral galaxies, they all appeared to be redshifted. So he sees these spiral galaxies, they all look like they're redshifted, and this is now interesting. <laughs> to complete the puzzle, we would have to wait until Edwin Hubble came along. Because when you look out in space, everything's really far away. And you, from up our perspective, it just looks like we're looking at sort of a flat plane that the stars and galaxies are sort of painted on. And so figuring out actual distances to these objects is a very difficult problem. 
And figuring out the distances to other galaxies was very difficult. And so Hubble was actually the first person to figure out how to make this distance measurement to figure out how the galaxies, how far away they were. And now armed with this, he was able to put what we call a Hubble diagram together. And so on the x-axis, we have the distance to these galaxies here. These units are megaparsecs. Uh, you might be more familiar with light years. And so this is about 60 million light years away or so here. On the vertical axis here, we have the redshift. And so if we interpret this redshift as a Doppler shift, because these things are moving away from us, then we would infer some velocity. The faster it's moving, the more things get stretched out, so the bigger this redshift would be. And so there's a correlation here that jumps out at us right away, but we see that as galaxies get more distant, their redshift also increases. And so the redshift increases with the distance, and so this is suggestive then that it's the space itself expanding. Why the space is expanding? Because things that are further away are more redshifted. So if you think about, say, a rubber band, people call it rubber band expansion sometimes. And so say if you had a rubber band, you can imagine just marking it with little tick marks all along the rubber band. Now grab that rubber band and stretch it out. Two points that start off fairly close together on the rubber band, now when I stretch it, they only expand by a little. But if I take two points that started off very far away on the rubber band, now when I stretch it, the space in between them increases by much more. And so they are then going, this happens at the same time, so they're going to look like they're moving faster. They're covering more distance as time goes by. And so this is suggested that it's the whole space that's expanding, and everything is now expanding away from us. All the galaxies we see, except for a couple of nearby neighbors, are all redshifted as they move away from us. <coughs> Now, you might start feeling special. If everything is moving away from us, well, doesn't that mean that we're in the center of the expansion then? If I look here and it's moving away, and here it's moving away, and it's all moving away from me like this, it seems like maybe we're in the center of the expansion. But not so fast. We have to consider how this would look from other people's point of view, too. And so, a moral going all the way back to Copernicus, is that we don't occupy a special place within the universe. We used to think that the sun and the whole universe, including the sun, all revolved around us. For the last 500 years or so, we've learned some humility. And so it's a principle that we don't occupy any special place within the universe. So suppose we're in galaxy three here. We're at rest. We're sitting here in galaxy three. And we look out and we see this rubber band expansion. And so if you're 100 megaparsecs away, you're expanding by about 7,000 kilometers per second away from me. At 200 megaparsecs, you're moving at about 14,000 kilometers per second, et cetera. Okay. What does this look like to the astronomers in galaxy two? Well, from their perspective, they're sitting there in their own galaxy. And from their perspective, they're at rest. And so they look out, and well, if, we, if they were moving 7,000 kilometers per second to the left relative to us, that from their perspective, we're moving in the opposite direction at the same speed, 7,000 kilometers per second away. <clears throat> Meanwhile, this galaxy one is 100 kilometers per, 100 megaparsecs away from them. What's the relative velocity between one and two? Well, it's 7,000 kilometers per second. And so they're going to measure the exact same relationship that we measure. If we're in galaxy one, it's going to be the same thing. They're sitting there at rest. Relative to them, galaxy 2 that's 100 megaparsecs away is receding at 7,000 kilometers per second. If you're 200 megaparsecs away, you're receding at 14,000 kilometers per second, etc. And so naively, you might think that since everything's receding away from you, you must be at the center. <clears throat> but indeed, regardless of which of these galaxies you were in, you would conclude that all the galaxies were moving away from you. And so the whole space is expanding. There's no special point. There's no center to the expansion. So that's the first difference we can rule out now between the explosion. There's no center to this expansion. All of the space is expanding. <clears throat> the next observation that we can make uh, is the following. This is a slice of what's called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this is the deepest galaxy survey that we've made to date. And so this is actually a full sky survey all over the entire sky we measured, and now we're just looking at a wedge of this survey. A wedge here, and then a wedge here. This is what we're looking at. And so this is a slice of our galaxy. 
And the cosmological principle says that there should be no special place within the universe. Not only do we not occupy a special place, but nobody occupies a special place. No matter where you are, the universe looks the same. And so we say that the universe is homogeneous. That means it looks the same. If I take a patch of the universe, if I take this patch, or this patch, or this patch, statistically they all look the same. I count about the same amount of number of galaxies, and they're clustered together in the same way. <clears throat> it's also isotropic, meaning that any direction I look in, the universe will look the same. And so if I look along this line of sight, or if I look along this line of sight, or if I look along this line of sight, <clears throat> No matter where I look, it's always the same. And so it looks the same in every direction, and it looks the same no matter where I decide to look from. And so if I existed over here, any direction I look in, again, the universe looks the same. If I exist in this galaxy, any direction I look in looks the same. And so on the largest scales, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. On very small scales, if we shrink things down, maybe it's not true. Here there's a galaxy, but here there's not a galaxy. But on large scales of about 100 megaparsecs or so, things look homogeneous and they look isotropic. So that's what we call the cosmological principle, and it's encapsulating this idea that there's no special locations within the expansion. <clears throat> and so the father of Big Bang Theory is actually a father. He's a Catholic priest, <clears throat> and he's Father George Lamarca. This guy was a Belgian priest working in the 1920s, and he was actually the first person to discover Hubble's Law. <clears throat> Uh, and so there's sort of a rule in science that things are rarely named after the person who actually discovered them. And this is one more case where Hubble Law was actually the second person to come along and find this. Uh, he didn't get the credit for a couple reasons. Number one, he published in a Belgian journal. And not that many people read Belgium, so you're just not going to reach as many people. And then Hubble was actually already famous. So in the early 1920s, Hubble had figured out how to measure the distance to galaxies. And this made him a famous scientist. So if you're famous and you're the second person to do something, it will be named after you every time because you're already famous. And so that's what happened with Hubble. And so Father George Lamatra actually was looking, his data also wasn't as good. Hubble had access to better data. But he was looking at similar data to Hubble's and he found this redshift relationship. And he said, hmm, well the universe is expanding, so perhaps. And now this leads him to the idea of the Big Bang Theory, which uh, one way to put it is this. Right now, if we look out, galaxies are receding away from us. And so if we could hit rewind of the universe, at least in the recent past, they would be coming towards us. Right now, they're expanding. If we hit rewind, they would come back. Now, as we hit rewind, there's a lot of possibilities for what could happen. Maybe they would bounce back. Maybe the galaxies used to be coming towards us, but they bounced, and then they, now they're moving away. Maybe it oscillates. Maybe you have some kind of periodic thing where the galaxies move away and come back and come back. The idea of the Big Bang Theory is that if you hit rewind, the galaxies will just continue to come together and come together and come together, and the density will go up and up and up and up. And so the idea of the, of the Big Bang is that if you hit rewind, everything will come together, and so you'll have an inf a basically arbitrarily large density and arbitrary large temperature. As the density goes up, things start to knock into one another more often, and so the temperature is going. And so that really is the idea, and that's what he called the primeval atom, this state of the universe with this extremely high density and extremely high temperature. It's not at one point, though, so you want to rewind the expansion and you imagine things coming to one point. We have to keep in mind all of the space is expanding. And so even though the density has gone way, way up, the universe itself is still infinite in extent. And so you can imagine laying a grid on the universe and now the spacing on that grid has gone to zero, but you still have a whole grid. So you still have a whole space, and now that space is filled with arbitrarily large density and temperature uh, energy. <clears throat> and so succinctly in one, sec in one sentence then, the idea of the Big Bang Theory is that starting in this arbitrarily high density and temperature state, the universe now begins to expand and cool, and it's just been extending and cooling off ever since. And so that's what I mean by the theory of universal expansion. The whole universe is expanding, and it's been expanding ever since this initial state. <clears throat> and so an analogy people often make then is the idea of expanding a balloon. <clears throat> so initially, 
we can think of the early universe, all of them, we can think of these coins here as being galaxies. So we've taken galaxies and we've glued them to this little bit here. As the universe expands, the galaxies themselves actually don't expand. They stay the same size. Here inside a galaxy, there's lots of stars around, there's lots of matter, so there's lots of gravity here in our galaxy, and that holds us together. And so the galaxies themselves don't expand, but the space between the galaxies is what really expands. And so we've taken our galaxies that stay the same size and affixed this to this balloon. And so in the early universe, things are very, very high density, but we still have a whole balloon. Now as we inflate the balloon, the space itself is what's expanding, and the galaxies ride this expansion. <clears throat> and eventually we get to, say, today, where now things have expanded, and we can look and say, well, these two coins started off fairly close together, and they've only expanded by this much. Whereas these two coins here, they started off further apart, and so they've expanded more. And actually, if you took that distance and divided by the time it took you to blow them up, you would come up with the Hubble's Law. Coins that are further away would be expanding at a higher speed away from <clears throat> The other nice thing is <clears throat> that this illustrates <clears throat> uh, is that the Big Bang happens everywhere. And so every point is a point of expansion. As you inflate the balloon, every point of rubber stretches out. And so the expansion happens everywhere. It's not just happening in one point in space, but it's a global event that happens everywhere. And I like to think of something that's still going on. Today, this space is still expanding. Expansion is still happening, it hasn't stopped. And so in some sense, the Big Bang is an ongoing event. This universal expansion is an ongoing event that's still happening today. And now here's a subtle point that this balloon has no edge to it. If I live on this balloon, then I could start here and I could walk around the balloon and I could get back to where I started. Just like here on the Earth, the Earth has no edge. You just keep going around and around and around. Similarly, the universe has no edge. The universe is infinite, and so when the universe expands, it's not expanding into anything. There's nothing else that exists to expand into. The universe is infinite, and it's just that the space between points gets larger as time goes on. <clears throat> and so this is a much, much better picture, though, of that explosion, which hopefully we've cast away. <clears throat> One subtle point here, perhaps, is that while the universe itself has no edge, it does have a horizon. There is a distance beyond which we can't see. And so perhaps the radical idea of the Big Bang is the idea that it had a beginning. And so, as I said before, people thought we're thinking that the universe was infinite. Lamatra says, no, the universe had a beginning. And there's actually sort of an irony there that originally scientists accused Lamatra of being overly religious. Because if you blur your vision hard enough, the idea that the universe had a beginning starts to sound sort of like the Genesis account if you really look hard enough. And so people were thinking, well, your, your religion or your spirituality is dictating your science, and we don't know how well-founded this is. Nowadays, there's an irony that now some religious people will criticize the Big Bang and reject the Big Bang for that reason, because it says that the universe is old. But according to Lamatra, the universe had a beginning, so it's not infinitely old and only has a finite age. And you probably know that light has a finite speed. It takes some time for light to travel. It's a huge speed, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, but it's finite. <clears throat> and so in 13.8 billion years, there's only been so much time for light to travel. And so objects that are further away from that, we can't see. There hasn't been enough time for them to get to us. They're still out there, but we can't see them. And presumably, the rest of the universe way outside here is still homogeneous and isotropic. And so we will never, ever be able to observe these galaxies, and they'll never be able to observe us. But presumably, their observable universe looks just like our observable universe. <clears throat> this now is also the real reason for the cosmological redshift. So I started off talking about a Doppler shift, and that was really just to motivate things. And because originally they did think what well, they did interpret it as a Doppler effect. <clears throat> if it was the Doppler shift, if there were really a galaxy that was just moving relative to us, then it would have to be limited by the speed of light. It could never go faster than the speed of light. But indeed, we actually see galaxies that are receding away from us faster than the speed of light. 
And so it's not that we're all in one frame of reference and they're moving with this huge speed. It's that our frame of reference itself is actually expanding. <coughs> light has some wavelength, and so light comes in little packets that are called photons. And so light starts off with some wavelength. In this case, it's a fairly blue wavelength. And now we expand the universe, and as the universe expands, the wavelength of this photon now gets stretched. And so as it gets stretched, the wavelength's getting longer, and now it's been stretched and enriched. And so the real reason that the light redshifts is not a Doppler effect, but it's because the space itself is expanding, and the space itself <coughs> is actually stretching. This will then tell us that more distant galaxies will be redshifted by greater amounts, because there takes more time for the light to reach to us, and so more expansion happens, and so the wavelength gets stretched by four more, and you have a bigger redshift if you're further away. And so the Big Bang Theory explains the cosmological redshifts. And so that's the first line of evidence in favor of the Big Bang. But there's sort of a circularity here, because the redshifts were the reason we posited the Big Bang. So of course the Big Bang ex ex explains the redshifts. <laughs> if it didn't, we were really bad scientists, right? So this was our primary motivation. We already knew about the redshifts. So that's perhaps not all that convincing. In science, if you really want to convince someone that your theory is right, you want to predict new phenomena they've never seen before, and you want to say, go look for this. And so let's discuss some things that they did not know at the time of the Big Bang, uh, at the end of the late 1920s when this was formulated. Another piece of evidence comes from what we call Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And so there was uh, someone who was actually just a PhD student, just a grad student at the time, Ralph Alpher, in the 1940s, <coughs> was studying the Big Bang, he was very interested in it. And he said, well, if in the early universe the temperature is very, very high, then it actually should be high enough that nuclear fusion should be able to occur. Protons should be whizzing around with enough energy that they can overcome their electrical repulsion, smash into one another, and fuse to form heavier elements. <clears throat> and so he said, well, if this happens, if we start off with nothing but protons, but they have now very high energy so they can smack into one another. After a while, what am I going to wind up with? And so he realized that this would happen actually just in the first few minutes after the Big Bang, and it would have to be a very, very rapid process because the universe is expanding and cooling, and you need high density and high temperature for fusion to happen. And so there's actually just a very short window for uh, this Big Bang nucleosynthesis in the beginning. But he did the math, he did the calculation, and he predicted, well, if this happened, you should wind up with about 90% hydrogen by abundance, about 10% helium, and then just a little smattering of everything else should be left over. You should have a little bit of what's called helium-3, a different isotope. So most of the helium in the universe is helium-4, but a little bit's in the form of helium-3. He predicted, well, you should create about this much lithium and about this much deuterium, you would also create a little bit of what's called tritium. That's another uh, that's hydrogen that has two neutrons in it, but it's very radioactive, so it all decayed away. And then that's it. That's the end of the game. You don't make anything else in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And here's the roof. Since we have a periodic table, I can tell you why. You start off using hydrogen into helium. Now if I can stick another hydrogen into that helium, I get lithium. And now next step would be beryllium. But beryllium is not stable. Beryllium decays very, very so that's the end of the road for Big Bang nucleosynthesis. You can't make anything heavier than that. <clears throat> and so nothing heavier than lithium gets produced. The tritium goes away, and now this is what you would be left with. Another piece of good evidence is that stars fuse elements. That's where their energy comes from. But the good thing is stars don't make any of this. Stars don't produce helium-3. They don't produce deuterium. They don't produce lithium. And they only make helium-4 a very small amount. <clears throat> and so all of the deuterium, lithium, and helium in the universe has to just be left over from the Big Bang. So your lithium-ion battery, all the lithium in there is left over from the first few minutes after the Big Bang. That's where it all comes from. <clears throat> and so all of this stuff is frozen in. Whatever was produced in the Big Bang, that's all you get. So now you can go and you can measure the deuterium abundance, you can measure the lithium abundance, etc. And what do you know? Your measurements actually exactly line up. So you have to calibrate this by the density of the universe. 
But now once you make that measurement, now you have a prediction for four different numbers. So if you can get all four numbers of those right at the same time, that's pretty compelling evidence that your model works. Lo and behold, we do see exactly what we expect. The universe is about 90% helium, it's about 10% hydrogen, and then there's a little smattering of other elements. Everything else has to get come up from stars or other astrophysics. This stuff is just left over from the Big Bang. So it's a nice clean test of the Big Bang theory. <coughs> Another line of evidence, and this is what I would really consider the smoking gun evidence in favor of the Big Bang Theory, is the existence of the cosmic microwave background. I've really never heard any other plausible explanation for where this could come from. Our friend Fred Hoyle did his best to explain the cosmic microwave background, I think, but just couldn't do it late in his career. <clears throat> and so again, our uh, Ralph Alpher is ba back at it again. At this point, he now was Dr. Alpher. So he was awarded his PhD for the, his work on Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and now he's at Bell Labs, I think, doing some research uh, with a fellow named Robert Herman here. And they propose that there should be a leftover relic radiation from the Big Bang everywhere you look in space. So let's talk about why that would be and where it would come from. <clears throat> so the universe starts off in this in state of arbitrary density and temperature, it actually starts off so hot that matter, as we know it, can't even exist. And so you might have heard of quarks before. Quarks are what make up protons. The early universe, the energy is so high that these quarks can't even form protons. You have free quarks out there in what's called the quark gluon plasma. So this is a very interesting area of research. As, time, as things go on and things cool down, eventually these quarks can now form protons. And so now, at this point, you basically have a sea of protons, electrons, and radiation, photons, light, all that heat energy. And then, and also some helium. And so this universe looks something like this at this point. You've got some helium out there, 25, 10% uh, helium, 90% hydrogen. You've got electrons, since the early universe is electrically neutral. And now you've got light, you have photons. And these photons, they want to stream around at the speed of light. That's what photons do. They take off at the speed of light. But the universe is so, so, so dense that everywhere a photon goes, it encounters an electron. And photons and electrons can scatter off of each other. It's called Compton scattering. And so these photons just want to stream off in space, but everywhere they go, they're hitting an electron. And so they're bouncing around and bouncing around and bouncing around and bouncing around, and they never actually get anywhere. They're trapped with the matter. We say that they're coupled to the matter. And so the photons and the electrons and the protons, they all exist in this soup, this hot plasma, all coupled together. And things are like the interior of the sun. It actually takes a photon about 100,000 years to make its way from the core of the sun to the interior, and then it only takes eight minutes to make it from the sun to us. <clears throat> so when you have this high density, the photons just can't get it. Now the universe continues to cool, and continues to cool, and eventually you get a point where for the first time, neutral atoms can form. <clears throat> must be wires right here, I'm saying. And so for the first time now, at this point, when the temperature hits about 3,000 Kelvin, at this point, neutral atoms can form. Before that, if an electron and a, and a hydrogen atom come to, uh, an electron and a proton, they would love to come together and form a hydrogen atom. But the universe is so dense that, that as soon as they do, a photon comes along and ionizes them. And so you have to you maintain this soup. Eventually, the temperature drops to where now, where a proton and electron, they come together to form hydrogen. And now the photons don't have enough energy to break them apart again. They don't have enough energy to ionize this atom anymore. And so at that point, neutral atoms start to form. And so now all of these electrons that were free, they all start to hook up with the, the protons to form hydrogen atoms. And so now I have neutral atoms. And so now from the photon's perspective, it's free streaming. Now all those electrons I was scattering off of, they've partnered off with the protons to make hydrogen atoms. And so they're not scattering me anymore. And now the photons just stream through space. And so they stream through space and they stream through space until some astronomer comes along and catches one of them in their telescope. And that's what we view today as the cosmic microwave background. <coughs> And so Alpher and his compatriot predicted that the CMB should have been released about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So the universe wasn't even a toddler yet, still in its infancy. 
And they predicted that it should have what we call a thermal spectrum. And so if you heat matter up, it will get, eventually it gets bright, right? If you heat up a poker in the fire, it starts to glow red. And that has a very particular spectrum. If you measure how much power is coming at each wavelength, it has what we call a thermal spectrum. And they predicted that it should have a temperature of 5 Kelvin. So they predicted it should have a black body to, or a thermal spectrum and a temperature of about 5 Kelvin. And this is in 1948. And again, no one had any reason to suppose that such a thing existed until they started contemplating the Big Bang. And so this is completely new physics that they were predicting should, be, should exist if the Big Bang is true. Fast forward not quite 20 years here to 1964, and two astronomers, or uh, two scientists at Bell Labs, were testing uh, a radio receiver. <laughs> they were testing this radio telescope here. And they were calibrating it, because they wanted to make some very precise measurements. And as they were trying to calibrate this, they kept finding this really annoying noise. And no matter where they looked, they found some noise in their telescope. They did everything they could to try and get rid of this noise. They had, they had people shut off the power lines nearby to see if the power lines were interfering with their telescope. They went out and they washed the pigeon poop off of the satellite because they thought maybe the pigeon poop was the heat from the poop or it was interfering somehow. They thought maybe that was causing it. So they really looked for everything they could to try and figure out what this noise was. The story goes that someone at Bell Labs was on a plane and happened to get sitting next to a cosmologist and they got to talking about what it was they did and he said, well, I'm working on this telescope and I can't get rid of this noise. It's everywhere in space. Everywhere I look, there's this low-grade noise. And this cosmologist, well, he had a plan to build a telescope just like this to look at the CMB and so he started to say, well, that sounds awfully familiar. Have you tried to take a spectrum of this noise? And so they went and looked, and lo and behold, this noise that they were finding, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. In science, one man's noise is another man's signal. Or mm -hmm. we want women in science, too. So one person's noise is another person's signal. And so what was bothering them was exactly what this other group of scientists were looking for. Fast forward a few years, and Penzias and Wilson, for more or less a happy accident, were awarded the Nobel Prize. So you've probably heard the saying, it's better to be lucky than good, it's best if you can be lucky and good. Penzias and Wilson were both lucky and good scientists, and so they wound up getting the Nobel Prize. And so <clears throat> if you go out and look, no matter where you look in space, this cosmic microwave background is coming at us from everywhere because it's left over from the Big Bang. Again, this was new physics that no one had any, any reason to suppose existed, and then when they looked for it, they found it. And so that's pretty convincing, pretty smoking gun evidence that some sort of Big Bang scenario really happened, or else where did this relic radiation come from? And no one's ever come up with any other explanation of where it might have come from. And so the CMB, here what we're mapping is actually the temperature of the sky. And so this is a picture of what the Big Bang, what the universe looked like about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And so a telescope you can actually think of as a time machine. When you put in a telescope and look at a distant galaxy, you don't see what that galaxy looks like today, right now, at this instant. You see what the galaxy looked like when it emitted that light. And a galaxy that's a million light years away, it emitted that light a million years ago. And so you're seeing it as it was a million years ago, not as it was today. So when we look at the CMB, we're seeing the universe as it was about 400,000 years ago. And what we're actually looking at here are hot and cold temperatures on the sky. And so if you take a spectrum of the, of the CMB, you'll find that indeed it does have a thermal spectrum, and that the temperature is about 3 Kelvin. The 1940s prediction was 5 Kelvin based off really bad data for the Hubble constant. So the fact they got it that accurate is pretty extraordinary as well. <clears throat> And this picture here might give you the impression that different parts of the sky are very different. But in fact, this is actually almost perfectly smooth. It's almost the exact same everywhere. But these are little deviations from the average. And so if you look, everywhere you look, the temperature is 2.7 Kelvin. But there are these teeny tiny deviations here of one part in 10,000. So if you look at one of these hot spots, and if I remember correctly, it's actually blue that's hot and red that's cold. If you look at one of these hot spots, it's like 2.700001 Kelvin, and the cold spots are like 2.699999 Kelvin. 
So it's almost perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, like we said. It's almost the exact same everywhere, but there are these very, very, very small deviations. And it's a good thing those deviations exist, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. So the reason some parts are hotter than others and some parts are colder is because there was more matter in the hotter parts. It was more dense. And since it was more dense, there's more matter falling in, there's more friction, things pumping around, and so things heat up and the temperature goes up. The cold spots, on the other hand, are under dense regions. There's less matter there, there's less bouncing around, so there's less heat. And so these teeny tiny deviations were little seeds for what would later grow into galaxies. They start off one, not even 1%, one percent, one part in so 0.001% more dense than their neighbors, but gravity now slowly does its work. They have just a little bit more mass, so they start to pull in mass from the underdense regions. And the underdense regions are losing mass, and so things come together and eventually form galaxies and everything that we see in the universe today. And so all the stuff that makes us, galaxies and anything that we see, must come from these initial anisotropies, if you want to be fancy about it, because they're deviations on directions you look at. And so each direction is ever so slightly different because of these initial anisotropies. And now this all grows. <clears throat> and so in the Big Bang Theory, then, the smaller structures should form first, and the, they should then merge to form larger structures. And so when we look at the distant universe, the most distant galaxies we see should be smaller somehow. Uh, clusters of galaxies, say, should be smaller than they are today. Things should grow from the bottom up, merging to make bigger and bigger structures. And that's exactly what we see in the universe. Clusters that we see now are bigger than they are at high redshift. This also then predicts that the distribution of galaxies should be homogeneous and isotropic, since these initial conditions are homogeneous and isotropic. And you can see if I take any characteristic patch, it pretty much looks the same. Just about anywhere you place it, you see the same sort of statistical behavior on average. <clears throat> and so a picture like that is nice to see what's going on, but if you want to do science with it, you need to somehow turn it into some math so that I can start doing some math and doing some statistics and figure things out. And so the last piece of evidence here I'll mention then is what we call the baryon acoustic oscillations. And so <clears throat> if we look at that temperature on the sky, you can probably see that there's a characteristic size. All of these little patches all look like they're roughly the same size. All of these little patches here all look to be about the same size. And indeed, they're all about a degree. And so if you look at the amount of power coming for each size, you should see a lot of power at one degree scales, because that's this typical size. And so that's what is actually being shown here. This is basically saying, what's the typical size of, it, of one of those patches on the CMB? And the typical size peaks right here at about one degree. And then there are some secondary other peaks uh, in the CMB, and these are called the CMB anisotropies. Where they come from is you have a competition between gravity and pressure. And so you have these little over densities, and so matter wants to fall in there under gravity. But this is before the CMB has been released, so the photons are still coupled to the matter. So when the matter falls in, the photons come in too. Things get heated up, the pressure goes up, and so things come back out. Now the density goes down, so the pressure is going down, gravity starts to win again, things start to recollapse, and you have this oscillation going on. And so what happens is things are oscillating, and now the CMB gets released. And so this first patch you see is matter that started its very first oscillation, that's falling in for the first time, and right when it hits maximum density, the CMB is released. And so that's the first degree scale, and that's why that's that characteristic patch. There's another patch that had just enough time to fall in, it fell back out, and now just before it started to come back in, the CMB was released. So it's at maximum rarefaction. This is now gives us the second piece. Now it starts to fall in, it hits maximum density, maximum compression for the second time, right when the CMB is released. And so that gives you your third. And so everything in between is happening, but most of the power is being output at these scales where there was just enough time for you to hit that spot when the CMB is released. And so now that the CMB is released, we see that it gets frozen in. 
and this scale, the scale for a single patch to come in, we can actually figure out what that size should be physically. And so now we have the physical distance of this patch, and we look at the CMB and we know it's one degree. And so this gives us a ruler that we can now go out and measure distances in space with, because now I can correlate one degree of that redshift with this distance. And so this gives us a prediction for what the galaxy should look like later. This gives us a prediction for what should be the typical size of a void or the typical size of clusters of galaxies. And so if you fast forward to make the prediction then of what it should look like later, lo and behold, you predict that you should get something that looks like the CMP. And so you can see that there's a typical size for these voids here. They're all roughly the same size. And so that's correlated with the CMP. And this now gives you another line of evidence in favor of the Big Bang. <clears throat> and so if you add it all up, if you take the redshifts, which were our original motivation, but now we came up with all new evidence. We came up with BBN, which was a new prediction, the CMB, which was a new prediction, <clears throat> and the DAO. These are all new predictions that have now all turned out to be true. Pretty compelling evidence in favor of the Big Bang. Which again, can be stated very succinctly as saying that the universe was born in a state of arbitrarily large density and temperature, and then it's been expanding and cooling ever since for approximately the last 14 billion years. <clears throat> we said the expansion is universal. It's not like an explosion all coming from one center, but every point in space is a, is a point of expansion. And so the expansion happens everywhere. The universe has no center and it has no edge. Meanwhile, the galaxies themselves just sort of surf this like surfing on a wave. They just ride the expansion, maintaining their current state until the end of distances 